It's a pleasure to be able to introduce uh, Jens Holm, partner in charge of the North American office of 3XN, um, which has existed for about five, five and a half years. Um, it's based North American practice, but it's based here in New York City. He's worked on a range of projects uh, in the office, institutions to hotel branding, uh, mixed use urban developments and arts and culture, cultural projects. Based on this experience through all these typologies, Jens brings a level of expertise to projects that have a proper balance between design and implementation, and you'll see a lot of that tonight. And in particular, while at 3XN, he's led the design of the most notable North American projects, including T3 Bayside, um, which is North America's tallest timber office building. You were in charge, Jens. Um, prior to joining 3XN, Jens had his own practice uh, called HAO, which started in 2010, and he had also served as a lead architect for OMA in Rotterdam and New York, and as an associate with Rockwell Group Architecture Planning and Design, also here in New York. Um, and maybe is one other thing that needs to be said is we're welcoming Jens back to NYT because he taught with us for a couple of years um, in around 2013, 2014, and some of his former students are here tonight uh, as well. So it's great to see everybody here. And with that, I will turn it over to you. So uh, can everybody hear me if I'm not at the microphone? Is that nodding you with the hat? Yeah, okay. So I'm gonna try and stay at the microphone, but I'm really terrible at standing still, which is uh, something you can all attest to, I think, from the office setting. So I'll do my best uh, to, to speak a little bit louder. Can't hear it, yell up, and then I'll try and uh, boost. Uh, uh, so first of all, thank you for, for having me back. Uh, as, as Matthias said, uh, I taught here for a little bit, which was uh, quite exciting. And I think uh, um, something where uh, what I remember from here is that there was really a lot of kind of talent and, and uh, tenacity in getting projects done. Uh, and I think also a situation where, at least back then, a lot of the students I had had jobs outside and they tried to kind of do this as well. Uh, which I think is something that really speaks to kind of the ambition of wanting to become an architect, which is not necessarily a given on, on every other uh, other places where you focus only on the architecture. It's not people who have to kind of do all these things and dance it out, which is something I'm about to do and aspire to. Um, Thank you. Is this going to work? Oh, that's this is going to be great. That's you like to choose a, a preset view to your camera. No, it's all good. I think you're fine. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I, I wanted to kind of just start by uh, maybe by show of hands who knows or is familiar with the work of the SM. Both of you suck in, in, in some particular uh, <laughs> fashion. Uh, no, I asked this question because, like, one of the things that we uh, have, and I'll talk a little bit about that in, in terms of how we, we, we approach the North American market, is that we are essentially uh, an inherently a Scandinavian office. We started in Denmark a while back. This is where we sit uh, in Copenhagen, down by the waterfront. These old uh, restored boathouses, and this is going to be a little bit of a theme of the evening. Uh, this idea of how we can reuse, how we can reuse things, uh, and 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 and, uh, and hopefully uh, find ways to kind of repurpose buildings as much as build new things, right? I mean, so these buildings here are, are all uh, old boathouses that were restored. It's now our office. This is where we used to make. Uh, uh, warships to go to war with Sweden. Uh, we've since stopped going to war with Sweden, so we can now uh, do other things in, in these buildings. But I think a good example of how things can last for a long time, and if we kind of take care of it and, and use it, uh, uh, let's say, properly, um, we can actually find ways to, to to reuse the things that are around us to a much larger degree than we are doing now. This is our uh, New York office. Uh, I chose this picture because you can see your Professor Altbreaker there sitting hiding uh, uh, weirdly behind a lamp and a screen with a headset on, which is how I see him uh, most of the time. Uh, we sit in the Navy Yards, also down by the water, also in a place that used to make warships, this time for the Second World War. Uh, now an area that's turned into 
you know better than I would say for, for let's say small manufacturing and kind of green and sustainability initiatives as we go through. Even. Uh, 3XN was founded in uh, the mid 80s, started out uh, inherently as a Danish office then slowly kind of doing things in Scandinavia, then things in Europe. Uh, and then now today uh, we, found, uh, we find ourselves inherently as a kind of global office. So we now have offices in Sydney, in Stockholm, in London, uh, and in New York, the office that I run, outside of, of the, uh, the office in Copenhagen. 80% um, of our work is now outside of Denmark, meaning that we are no longer necessarily, let's say, a Scandinavian office, uh, even though we build a lot around the, the roots and the kind of fundamentality of how we think in Scandinavia and what we think is important uh, uh, for that. And I would say almost all of our work is similarly, maybe 80% is competition driven, meaning that Somebody uh, calls us and invites us to do a competition. We do our best to have at whatever that is, either win or lose, and then move on to the next. That means that we as an office do not have a particular typology that we are the best at. We have a very uh, wide range of work, meaning we go from, from hospitals to residential offices to, to uh, museums to whatever it is that comes out, uh, which gives us, I think, a, a kind of a very different attitude in some ways than maybe North American offices, where they oftentimes we tend to, to be, let's say, a residential office or an office office or an educational office. So, so we kind of pride ourselves from not being one thing, but actually working very broadly on, on any number of technologies. Uh, inside uh, 3XN, we have our sister company, GXN, GreenXN, that we founded in 07. Uh, we set up GXN as a kind of test uh, for to see if it's possible to essentially have a sustainability arm to uh, an architectural office. So in the very get-go, the, the idea was that this is not, it has to be an independent office that can run and, and create revenue and, and get jobs on their own. So it cannot be something that just sits there. It actually has to be a functioning. Right? And for a while, that was hard and, and, and really kind of difficult to get to. We talked a lot about sustainability and we talked a lot about what to do. And it wasn't really until we found a way to kind of change the, the conversation between from, from sustainability to a way where clients can actually maybe save money or do better things, uh, cheaper or reuse things that come out that, that the company that really started to grow. So now we're around 20 people there. We do a lot of research into uh, different ideas for structure, uh, carbon retention. We do a lot of research into materiality. We have uh, PhD students uh, who essentially go out and, and kind of try and understand spatial qualities in general. So we, we, we can find better tools to, to do architecture down the road. Right? Uh, and that means also for us at 3XN, on my side of the things, we work very closely together with GXN on all of our projects. So every competition we do always has a, a GXN uh, component, meaning that we always sit with them and talk about what are the opportunities and possibilities we have, what are the things that we can incorporate into the buildings and projects we do. So that sustainability doesn't become an add-on in the end, but it's something that is built in from the very beginning uh, as we start and approach every part. So we work independently, but we also always work together. And one of the things we have found uh, through this collaboration and kind of understanding in general, and one of the things that we're driving a lot of the things that we as an office now focused on and thinking of over the last five or 10 years, is that we've become uh, extremely good at building things. Like we can put things together very, very well. We can almost build anything that we can imagine, the tools we have available, digital otherwise, and help us. Uh, manufacture and produce whatever it is we want. So, so we are, uh, they, like just, I would say from 10, 20 years ago to today, infinitely better at building buildings and at putting things together. And there's really kind of almost no restrictions to, to what we can do on that arm. We are, on the other hand, uh, exceptionally terrible at understanding what happens to those buildings that we don't need. We basically, I think it's something like 80 to 90% of, of buildings that are thrown down become landfill. Meaning that all of that material, all of that effort, all of that thinking, all of that technology into doing something becomes this. And that in itself is a very unsustainable way of, of approaching, you know, life in general, but also how as a let's say as a planet, we have a kind of finite loop, we have limited materiality. We need to, I think, as a as a field, as a trade, uh, to become approximately five thousand times better at, at disassembling things and understanding how we can get these components out of buildings again. As we move along, and, and we see all of this kind of a little bit in the perspective of what, what's happening in the world, what are the drivers today, right? We know that around 40% of, of uh, our CO2 emission comes from our industry, from the building industry, right? That's basically you know, us doing this thing that we do as architects building. 
a third of the global waste comes from construction, which is also not great. We need to find a way to kind of eliminate that or uh, put that down to something else. We know we need to, to uh, put our CO2 emissions radically down, right? If we, if we want to kind of at all try and hit this kind of 1.5 Celsius global warming situation, right? And I think, I hope we're all aware of what's happening in the world in general, right? But I think this is kind of one of the key aspects, I think, of where architecture if it is not already going there, it should be going now. Like, what what is it we can do uh, as as, a, as as people that work in this field to to, to help kind of uh, get these numbers down into a place where we can actually work with? So the good news is that we've gotten a lot better over time to deal with operational problems. We do meaning that our systems are better, our envelopes are better. We can kind of insulate better. We can do all of those things better. But the way that we build, like the fundamental aspect of how we put a building together, how we get something off the ground, is still uh, not great. Like it's, it's a situation where if you want to make a real impact, I'm getting the sign again. If you want to make a real impact, that's where we really have to kind of figure out what to do. Right? So what we are thinking about and what we are looking at is to see there's the kind of idea of, of business as usual. Then we can start optimizing the design, which will give us something, but not necessarily everything that we need. Uh, but what I think we and others are really trying to think about now is that how can we uh, think about things like retention? How can we use things or reuse things, uh, either existing buildings that are there or materialities, those materials we can get out of buildings that that uh, that we are going to potentially tear down, but then maybe make you know what we call material libraries to understand what can be used from the buildings that are that are coming, right? And I think this is something where, I mean, we, you know, at least some of us live in Manhattan or in New York, right? I mean, like this is, just one example of, of any number of examples, but this idea that we will tear down a 52-story building to essentially build a 52-story building uh, on top of it without having any plan for how to reuse all of the materials, all of the things that go into, is simply not really a sustainable way for us as architects to keep thinking about how the world is going to go together. And if you look at Manhattan in general and or any other large-scale city, right, this is a place where we build high-rises now for 100-plus years. Any number of these are now at a point where they are either not feasible to do what they programmatically need to do, they don't really work from a system standpoint, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to find, I think, a formula or a way to start thinking about our world and, and then the things around us, the buildings around us, not as kind of a series of elements to tear down or build up, but simply see it as almost kind of a material catalog saying that here in Manhattan, we have 8 billion gazillion square feet of glass. We have 8 uh, billion uh, square foot of, of, of uh, stone, et cetera. And so we can start thinking about our cities as something that can actually be reused from the ground up, right? And I think this, for me, and, and my small kind of ask of you guys, uh, once you go through this, make this the thing to do, right? Because I think this is the only way that we are going to try and find a way to get to those numbers of sustainability that we need to get to. So within our office, we think about this in a couple of different ways. And, and, and we are trying, we are still kind of, on our own, uh, our own side, we're trying to understand how do we set this up and understand it best, right? But on a very rough scale, right, we can start down below and say the traditional way of doing something, we can demolish a building that's there. We could focus on recycling those elements that are in there. We've done quite a few projects now in London and across Europe where we set up and go into buildings before they're going to get torn down. If, we, if, it's, if it's basically said we can't reuse the building, we go in, we, uh, we try and estimate and understand what are all the materials that are here, how much aluminum is here, how much stone is here, what can we take down, what can we reuse. So even if we have to demolish something, we need to think about what is it that we can reuse from, from those elements that are there. That's a little bit the same as uh, the next point, right? We can disassemble things or reuse things uh, from buildings that are there. We can think about partial retention of uh, refurbishment, meaning we're keeping some of the structures that are there and then basically building new around it or find other ways to, to, to look at it. Or we can simply say we accept the envelopes that are there and then find ways to retrofit and upgrade the things that are there, right? And so the projects I want to kind of show today is, is, is based kind of loosely around these four things. A lot of it focuses on, on uh, let's say, construction methods or way to build uh, differently from steel and, and concrete, but also how, how do we actually find ways to, 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 to use existing things around us. So we're going to start here, uh, a competition we won I guess four years, three years ago now, the Cobalt Hub in uh, Denmark. This is a, a robotics factory that sits outside, uh, I think the third largest city, city of Denmark. It's a building that's essentially set up around a very basic system of modules that can extend and expand. So you can get double height, triple height modules, you can get uh, atrium spaces set up, but the same module repeated over and over again. 
gives us uh, efficiencies in the way that we produce those modules and how we set them up uh, and gives us a way to kind of then combine and put together the building. So this was one of the images from the competition entry uh, of, the, of the main entry, a, a very kind of straightforward building, almost seen as a kind of factory building more so than, than, uh, than an office building as we go through. But a building where on the inside there's a real emphasis on creating kind of space for people to get together and then use these modules kind of in a way where you won't see it necessarily as just modules that come through, but really emphasizing the life that can happen there, right? So if you start looking down the building in the center, an area for everybody to get together. Um, and then along the sides, this is a timber construction building. So the whole structure is, is in timber. And then using a kind of minimal materials around it, meaning that we don't put in ceilings, we don't add anything else, we expose all the dock work, et cetera, so that we minimize the amount of material that has to go into the building as we set it up. And then essentially there's a, a huge amount of flexibility that goes into this in the sense that you can simply build walls and tear down walls in between the structure as it goes through. And here you can kind of see the, the, the happy little robots that are fizzing around doing robot things, I assume. Um, and then the kind of main atrium space uh, of, of, of that building as a whole. And this is all essentially put together with these elements, right? So, so timber components that, that come to site and then are kind of put together as almost a kind of erector set and can also be disassembled later. So if at some point you don't need this building, you can take these things apart and then kind of arguably use those same elements later on for, for, for other projects to go through. So this is what the construction looks like now. You can start to see some of those, those internal spaces. It's almost topped out uh, uh, in this kind of aerial shot here. And here you can kind of see uh, one of the things that's kind of near and dear to our hearts is kind of attempt to say whatever we produce in our competition renderings, whatever it is we put out there is also what we, we build at the end. So, I mean, I know this is going to be a kind of little bit of a theme of the evening because I think one of the things that's fantastic about being a competition driven office is you get to test and try out a lot of things, but it also really comes with uh you know the responsibility of knowing that what you actually put out there the images you put out there can be done and can be built right and so we have an office spend a kind of insane amount of time up front in the competition area testing all these things out understanding the engineering of it and, and knowing exactly what it is that we put out so that when the developer or whoever the client is come back to us and say we would like you to build that we can say we would be happy to but we are going to build exactly that because we know we can do that right and so there's no kind of back and forth on it so much. It's more a matter of like, how do we actually get the process done? Um, another timber construction, this is a hybrid uh, project in Sweden called Forskon, a life science project that has a combination of office space and life science spaces coming through. It shares some of the same ideas uh, on the inside um, as the Cobalt Hub. So essentially removing the sensor and creating this kind of a atrium that runs all the way through. Uh, which sets up this this notion that you can actually always see what's happening around you, right? I mean, so so the inside of the building becomes almost this kind of new town square. You can walk through it freely and you can kind of understand what's happening on multiple levels as you go through. And as you move up the building, you get this kind of, let's say, a kind of layer of privacy from, from the atrium space where you're exposed to everyone. And as you kind of move towards the facade, you get more and more kind of uh, enclosed and, and more privacy in, in those office spaces that are there. But again, a building where you can set up new offices uh, as, as you go along and really kind of work uh, or use the building over time to kind of change the, the, the typologies of office space you need inside. So this is what it looks like today. It's almost done. It will be finished next year in January. Uh, all the exterior cladding is wood, as you'll see a little bit. Here's the kind of staircase on the inside that kind of leans over and, and uh, connects all of those spaces as we go through. This is Sweden, so you can get some really super beautiful uh, wood uh, things which is nice. Um, and just to say again, I think this as a hybrid structure, meaning that all of those facade elements that normally would have been uh, aluminum or stone or something else that is now also in, 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 in timber here, right? And we know from, from some of the projects we'll talk about a little bit later that those savings can, can in, in carbon can be up to kind of 50% for a project as we go through, meaning that we kind of cut in half what goes out into the environment uh, as we go through. Uh, so the next project here is T3 Bayside. This is what uh, Matthias also has been involved in. Like, uh, this is going to be our first full timber construction project in North America. Um, the competition here was set up as, as uh, essentially twin buildings that, that uh, uh, create a kind of gateway or an entry point into a new neighborhood uh, down by the waterfront in Toronto. Uh, we are currently finishing up the first of the buildings, uh, the guy here on, on the left, and then basically the learning from this one didn't go into for the other one on the other side, but basically two buildings that work together to create uh, a, a kind of new entry form. So the whole idea how, around these buildings was to kind of find a way to say, 
we want to find a way to expose the life that happens inside these office buildings. Oftentimes when you go by in the streets in New York, right, you look up and you really have no idea what's going on inside these volumes that are sitting around you. So here we essentially set up an idea around these double height spaces that start down in the lobby space. And then they interconnect all the way up to through building loops around and come back down on the other side. So essentially you could walk into the lobby and walk up the staircase and then take a kind of full loop of the whole building to kind of see what's happening and then what are people working on or what is going on in the building as a whole. And then to the exterior, uh, it also exposes the life that's there. Those, the first three steps that go in through the, the, the main plaza, uh, you're standing in one of the buildings looking at the other here, are all public steps, meaning that they are essentially the lobby, shared workspaces and exhibition spaces, or lecture spaces as you go up. So there's an idea of this kind of three-dimensionality of how to activate space on the ground, right? So we don't get just two plants and a bench, but really something where life will happen also on the first three floors on both of those buildings as you go through. So you can kind of understand and see what is the activity that's going on uh, here. If you stand inside these double high spaces, this is kind of one of the versions that you could see. Uh, so essentially see a kind of a continuous connecting staircase that goes through the double high spaces that continue up. And then these spaces are then set up to become meeting spaces, share spaces for each of the floors. So every floor in the building has the opportunity to use uh, one of these. And here we can kind of see in, in the two buildings how these, these, these spaces connect all the way around and can change and program over time. Um, and one of the things that's, I think, kind of quite fascinating about this thing is it was also one of our first uh, attempts of seeing how can we build a, a building that can also change and be flexible for the future. So in each double height space, the mechanics are already put in, uh, and those spaces can then become either double or single height over time. So if you if you start out by having a full connection of double height spaces, you can start filling things in if you need more space as you go through, or take out as you go along. But that's all incorporated into the structure that's there and all set up, so it becomes a fairly easy uh, system to do. And you can kind of see on, on, on the left here the diagram of the double high space and the facade are setting up, but then essentially coming in and kind of pulling out those floors. So, so having an opportunity to kind of almost future-proof a little bit the buildings and really work with it in a way where, where we hopefully can get back to this kind of idea of, of where architecture maybe should be going, right? You can either build the... Uh, the fantastic dragon or the super scary spider or that kind of terminator robot thing but all from the same kit of parts right so we don't see buildings necessarily as static objects that have to either be one thing or go away or or not exist at all right so i think for us the hope is that we can kind of get to a point now where where um, where elements of buildings are seen as as things that can be reused or reproduced uh, and, and taken back and be be used for for other projects as as we go through and here you can kind of see in the facade some of those double height spaces uh, as, as they connect down through. Uh, this is a hybrid timber building, meaning the first floor, there's two floors of concrete uh, and, and a concrete core. Uh, that concrete core also gives us a place to put the crane. So basically the crane sits there and, and lifts off all the elements. You can kind of see the facade coming up. It is essentially a grid building, meaning that there's a lot of flexibility in how, how to, to deal with it. Um, and here you can kind of again to see some of the comparisons between the competition images on, on the low and then what, what's actually happening now and being built there. So again, this notion that we can actually build more or less what we, what we put out. Uh, there was an idea in the competition that we could have wood on the facade. That unfortunately is not possible uh, above six stories in Toronto, so therefore not that. But, but other than that, it's, it's pretty much the same, same building as we go through. Here you can kind of see the the lobby coming down the corner, and this is what it looks like today. I think this is one of the pictures you uh, took uh, a month ago, I'm going to say. Um, so I think a, a building that's going to be pretty fantastic when it's up and running, but also really a test case to see how flexible can we make a, a timber building, right? And this is a building that uh, in itself will save around 50% of its, its uh, CO2 expenditure simply by using timber as, as, uh, as a product. Here's the full facade uh, from the building as so. well. Um, switching back uh, to, to, to the US, this is a project in Baltimore we just won three weeks ago, so you are the first to see it. Uh, sitting down on the harbor front in Baltimore called The Sale. Um, this is a combination of, of retail and, and marketplace uh, buildings. Uh, essentially, just to give you a little bit of background here, we are block C and D uh, sitting down by the water. Uh, the, the, the waterfront in Baltimore today is fairly inaccessible and been kind of shut off over time. I see somebody nodding, so I, I hopefully so far nobody's lying about that. That's good news. <laughs> um, and one of the big mandates here was like, how do we actually get people down to the water again? And how do we create a building that both invites people to come there, but also something that has enough permeability 
to, to allow people to pass through. So a couple of simple moves, dipping down to get down to the park and invite your people up, giving some height toward the city side, inviting that slope, that softness that comes down and really gets the park integrated in, which also allows for these elevated views, both in the park area and the harbor itself. And then kind of translating that into a series of stacked terraces that go up through the entire building that becomes kind of activated by program behind it. Um, and then through that, you can actually permeate through the building on all sides, right? Meaning that there's no way to know the building where it's shut off. So if the building itself becomes open uh, to go from, from the city side to the water side. So this is what it looks like when it sits down at the water. So essentially a kind of continuation of the existing waterfront, right? You can kind of see how it sloops down and comes down at scale and invites you in and connects to the city park that, that sits on the corner. Um, and then as you start kind of looking at it up, you get these terraces that are all for the first two or three levels are all uh, involved in this kind of marketplace retail space down below. And then as it starts going up, it becomes more about restaurants or, or office space that's there. But all of them have access to, uh, to, to exterior space, with lots of greenery that can grow uh, throughout. And once you start kind of getting up here, you are on the kind of second, third level, you start getting these other views over the water uh, of, of Baltimore itself. Uh, one of the big parts of this was really just back to that permeability, like how do we make sure people can get through? So here we are standing on the city side, kind of looking through the building. So this kind of large archway promenade that goes through, setting up the view of the, I'm going to go with the independent ship. It's probably Constellation. It's the Constellation, my apologies, to the Baltimoreans in the room. Um, but essentially using that access corridor and it's kind of break as, as going through the entire building, exposing all the program that's there, also taking you through as you come in a series of atrium spaces so you can see what's happening up and down the building. So again, a kind of a full timber building. Uh, the first floor is likely going to be concrete to due to potential flooding there. So we need to kind of secure that, that layer of it. But other than that, uh, again, a building that likely will save somewhere between 30, or, uh, 30 and 50% uh, of, of, of carbon emissions. The ground floor in the building is, is designed as this kind of loose, flexible space. So almost a kind of warehouse where typologies can change. You can have a kind of fixed uh, marketplace with stalls everywhere. Over time, you can change it to slips, boat slips coming in, or have a more kind of traditional build up as you see there. But really kind of again saying that we, we, we know what we would like to build today, but we are not at all sure what's gonna happen in the next five, 10 years. And we wanna make sure the building can accommodate whatever that change is that happens over time. Here you can kind of see it on the waterfront side, the other side of the arch coming through. You can and a big part of this was also working with, with uh, the guys who are doing the park, Unknown Studio, uh, to really make sure that all the vegetation here kind of works and comes in uh, uh, through and up the building. Uh, and then the building itself is set up in a way where it actually passively shades itself. So we, we, the expectation here is that we can take a lot of that solar and, and, and radiance out of the building simply by, by, uh, by having that combination. Here you can see it down by the water and then uh, the, the obligatory money shot at dusk where everybody is super happy and excited about uh, being at Baltimore on the waterfront. Uh, so we will hopefully start the project, um, I would say early next year, depending on approvals from, from the city there. Uh, another kind of hybrid project we're looking at is uh, the Rothman Commons in uh, Toronto. This is gonna be our first educational project. Um, it's a school that shares both uh, students and faculty in, in one go. Uh, and similar to the other, uh, it sits in a kind of, uh, uh, an existing fabric that both have kind of, let's say, very modern buildings to the north of it, uh, those kind of blocks that sit here, and then kind of has to connect to this, the old fabric of the existing school on, on the other side. So this is the volume we're given. The, the initial program layout was extremely striated, meaning that essentially you have somebody on the top, somebody on the bottom, but really no way to kind of meet each other anywhere in the middle. And, and one of the first thoughts here was really to try and see how can we mediate that height difference between the modern side and, and the kind of traditional side on the other end, setting up these kind of diagonal slices uh, through the building, which sets up these terraces that go through, uh, uh, running uh, diagonal through and also setting up views of the existing campus around. And that gives us a way to distribute the program here. So the yellow here is faculty and then and, and the, the kind of bluish uh, purple stuff is all the students. So they essentially kind of sit above and below, but then they share this terrace space in between. So they become this kind of mixing chamber between you know, the people in charge and the people are actually there to learn something. Um, and that gives us a final massing looking something like this and a building that kind of steps down towards the corner. So we can kind of see the new buildings here on the side, something that uh, is, is a little bit contested on the campus as well. And then that kind of slides over to this. So I think our job by and large was to find a way to kind of get from that scale and that materiality down to something else. Right? So 
the building opens up towards the corner. This is where you enter, and then you can kind of start start your way in through uh, from from that area. And if you kind of lift up the lip, you can kind of a lid of the the thing. You can kind of see here how you come in on the corner. You start uh, kind of walking through. All of those terraces that are there are flexible space that can be set up for different ways of using classrooms. Uh, and then all the kind of uh, the space that has actual programming rooms sit in behind. So essentially it's a combination of, of, of enclosed and open space, but really trying to push the program in a way also where we maximize uh, anything that circulation in itself becomes wide enough that it actually becomes space or platforms or terraces to use so that we avoid hallways, we avoid like rest, leftover space that you can't really use for anything and then throw all of that out so it becomes occupiable space and flexible space over time. So here, just kind of walking through it, you can see coming in the lobby, you start to, to, to kind of walk up, uh, up to the first of the terraces here. So this whole plateau here is then the first of the flexible spaces with the, the more kind of quiet spaces set into the building behind it. You can kind of see more of those stepping up. And then here we are standing on the first of the bridges going into the faculty. So this is, you know, when one of you have done something bad, this is the bridge you will have to cross to get into uh, Matthias Altwicker's office to be told what, <laughs> what, uh, what has gone wrong. But essentially this notion that the faculty sits on one side and the students on the other side, and then they share the space in the middle. So there's not a separation between the two, but there's actually a, a kind of shared and common space in the middle of the building. So if you kind of look at it just uh, systematically, we have the terraces that go through, the bridge connections, and then the kind of overall circulation for, for the students that can go all the way up to the top uh, of the building. On the lobby level, um, there are, there's an auditorium space and, and, and bar space, et cetera, as well. And this is one of the challenges with, with this project is that it actually has two sub-level spaces as well. And I think one of the things I remember from the first year that I taught here is that I was sent into the basement next door, uh, which was something about taking an elevator two floors down and then entering a room uh, with no windows and no light and no uh, life. Uh, and there we would then uh, talk about architecture and all the fantastic things that architecture can do. And I think that is a challenge. I think there is a, a kind of general, no, but this is not a critique. This is just a comment on the, uh, it is a challenge, I think, to, to talk about uh, designing things and, and, and how we see life and things if our spaces are not up to par of what it is we are trying to teach, right? So I think in this case here on the ground level, there's a lot of different uh, opportunities for smaller niches, more open spaces. The auditorium space is open most of the time and can be used as well. Um, but we really wanted to find a way also to kind of key and connect together those two ground floor levels to the top. So, so the GXN side worked a lot with the kind of behavioral side of things to try and understand how do we create a palette of materials and, and, and tactility to really make sure that even if you are on the lower levels here, you still feel like you're part of whatever is happening above. And then we are utilizing that kind of double atrium space that comes in. So this is the second basement level where you still get a fair amount of light but really trying to make sure that there's no change in materiality as you go through. Uh, so you don't really feel like you're kind of in the basement of doom uh, when you have to learn something about finances. That's it. The other aspect of, of uh, the project here was to really try and find a way to, to materially fit uh, this kind of idea of a modern building into a traditional campus. So, you know, there's a lot of stone, a lot of history, a lot of uh, ornate things happening, right? And I think oftentimes the challenge with, with modern buildings is that they we seem or tend to think that they also have to only apply modern materials, meaning that they somehow they stand out and become very different from the, the, the fabric around it. Uh, in this case here, we are working with a kind of terracotta, fluted terracotta facade that is very similar in material to those existing buildings that are around. So trying to find a way to mediate this kind of the hyper-modern to the north and then the more traditional to the south in a building that is inherently very modern in, in what it's trying to do, but then from a materiality standpoint, really builds on what the campus uh, uh, already has. Um, so the next couple of projects, uh, we'll talk a little bit about how, how we work with, with retention, like using existing buildings and then adding new things to it. Uh, this is a party we did in uh, Stockholm a while back. It has been one of the most contented projects in, in uh, I think, the history of Sweden in the sense that uh, this is a landmark building on the corner, and, and the whole idea of adding a building something to it in itself was was a, a massive challenge, right? I mean, so we have on the corner the, the existing building, and then on the other side, the kind of uh, the new and additional building that comes through. So again, I would say a very modern building that sets up and, and, and takes some of the language and some of the patterning from the existing building there, but really tries to kind of emphasize that and work with that as you go through. And then if you look at it kind of side by side where they meet, you, you, you get a feeling, I think, that 
while it certainly is a new building and, and a different building that sits next to it, it's not necessarily a building that tries to kind of be inherently uh, uh, out of whack with, with the existing context that's there. It's trying to work with some of the rhythms that, that exist and then try to kind of fold in to the existing fabric that's there. So the two buildings are then keyed together by this kind of sloping roof that comes over and sits on, on the existing building uh, next to it. And you can kind of see here in the elevation, so kind of two thirds new and, and, and one, third, uh, one third old. And if you walk down the kind of main shopping street of, 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 uh, of, of Stockholm here, you will essentially never really experience the fact that there's a new building right next to it, even though the roof has changed a little bit, like the, the, the appearance and the, let's say, the, uh, the aesthetic of it is maintained in this kind of old city language. Uh, so you kind of have to go down the side street to, to see the new thing. And then the interiors were all treated similarly. So they're an upgrade of all of the interiors, but really working with the same materiality of the existing building in the new building to try and find like a way to kind of make sure that the two would feel, you know, in, in tune with each other as we go through. Uh, another example of, of, of retention uh, or reusing existing uh, things is uh, our project Gospen in, in Aarhus. Uh, this is essentially a community center that sits in the, uh, in the rail yards. Uh, flanked by either side by two old rail yard buildings that are no longer in use. It used to be where they would repair trains and paint trains uh, in between. Uh, so this building essentially has a dual uh, dual function. It, it's both a community space for for the people around it, but it also is a building that needs to kind of connect these two spaces and and and, and set up new uses for them. So each of those spaces next to it are exhibition spaces that can hold, you know, anything you can imagine, uh, art or, or lectures or book sales or whatever it is there, but essentially then now connected by this new volume or this new building that sits in between. Um, this is also a building that allows you to kind of invite you to come up and walk on the roof. Uh, and then so you can kind of inhabit the building everywhere. Um, in Denmark, we have no mountains. So the mere idea of getting up slightly high is a very, very exciting prospect for us. As a, and so this is uh, this is it. This is as high as it's going to get. This is also where the kids are sledding down uh, every window. It's also a building that tries to be, let's say, very informal about what it wants to do, right? So it, it doesn't really prescribe what the user spaces are. It can be, you know, this on a day-to-day, -to -day. somebody is skateboarding, somebody is biking, that dog is doing whatever that dog is doing. But it doesn't really talk about public space in a way to say, you have to do this or you have to do that. Uh, that also means that it has the ability to change quite quickly and become something else, right? So they can have festivals, they can have everything else there because the place, the space itself is, let's say, on pressures in, in what it tries to do. And I think this, just as a kind of general comment of public space uh, in, in North America, right, I think there's oftentimes a tendency to think that if you have public space here, something that is occupiable by everyone, you also have to program it so that everybody can be told exactly what to do all the time, right? And I think... There's almost nothing more boring in the world to go to a park and then be told you kind of have to sit right there and over there you can touch that ball and over there there's a tree. Right? I mean, so I think we need to also kind of think about those public spaces uh, around us and how do we allow those spaces to become, you know, unprogrammed or accept the fact that things can happen here that we are not necessarily in charge of and kind of give up a little bit of this kind of architectural uh, Darth Vader uh, situation where we want to control every single aspect of, of, of life as, as we move along. Um, another another project we uh, finished recently is uh, one of two hotels we are doing in, in uh, Greece. Um, here we were essentially hired by a client who owned a hotel that sat in this position, uh, a fairly outdated situation, um, who were told by the city that if he tore this down, he would not be allowed to build something new. And so he reached out to try and find a solution of how do we make something new out of something existing. So this is the Hotel Nico, uh, A1970. I think we can all agree, a building that is staggeringly beautiful in its simplicity of, uh, of stuff, uh, but clearly maybe in need of a, of a wee bit of an overhaul. Um, this is what it looked like when it was first constructed in, in its heyday. Um, this is the competition entry we, we put in for it, essentially removing the existing facade, creating a new facade with balconies on it, but reusing all of the existing structure behind it. So the entire original building is still here and then being upgraded of course in, in various ways but essentially kind of recladding everything with function so not just let's say new windows but actually something that you can engage with and interact with uh, and this is what it looked like today uh, it was finished uh, last year ready to go so i think for all intents and purposes something you would walk by and think is a new building and something that that has kind of found a language of what is around it right but but uh, but again something that that has reused everything that's there already 
Um, so, you know, go stay there when you go to Greece. Uh, building a little bit, of course, of this whole idea of kind of Greek columns. Uh, we couldn't kind of help ourselves on, on that particular case. Uh, and also a place where we didn't go through and kind of reusing a lot of the stone we could find in the existing building and using that for the interior uh, again. And see it from above and how it sits uh, down by the water. Um, another example of, of, I would say, both a kind of reuse, but also really trying to focus on the, the sustainability itself is the IOC building that we finished, I think now, how many years ago, Cody? I'm going to ask you, five years? Five years. I'm going to go with five years. Um, it's currently, I think, the highest rated lead building in Europe with around 95 uh, points. It was slated as an extension to the existing IOC headquarters here, and I think we can kind of some point have a conversation about what an extension looks like versus uh, or something. But but a lot of the work here was really to try and find a way to mediate that scale with that scale, right? I mean, and so essentially building up a building that instead of being one big lump kind of steps down gradually and becomes landscape as it moves towards the, the building uh, next to it. It's also a building where there was an existing pavilion on site where we managed to reuse uh, pretty much all of the materials, all of the steel and all the structure that was there went into the, the new building uh, as it went along. And here you can kind of see how it sits. I think something also where the building itself kind of tries to lean a little bit away from what was there already, but breaking up the building a lot in these layers going through. Um, this was a building that was built just around the time when the IOC was in a little bit of trouble. Everybody thought they were cheating uh, everybody everywhere. So they very specifically asked for a building of glass so that you could walk up and look in the windows and see that nothing was wrong here. So uh, a big portion of this was really driven by wanting to have transparency, like physical transparency to kind of mediate, uh, you know, other things, let's say. You can kind of see it from, from the street as well. So always this kind of notion that there's a landscape element and a building element that goes through and it kind of keeps coming down low enough so that when you meet the building, you're almost never up straight against the facade, but almost meeting kind of a park or a landscape element first. And then, of course, it being the Olympics, we really had to use the rings for something. Uh, so this, this, the interior staircase of the building essentially is modeled around those Olympic rings that go there. And this is something that... Um, in our, I think all of our projects, we have a really big emphasis on using transportation movement from floor to floor as, as something that expands quite radically out from just being to get from A to B. And I think a big part of that is back to kind of our idea and understanding that in order to meet the people you work with or the people you live with or the people that are around you, you need to facilitate that movement and give people that movement uh, uh, let's say a little more panache than just going up a staircase or, or, or the fire escape that is in the back, right? So if you make make a gesture out of it and make something that is grand enough, people also will use it uh, on a daily basis. It's also something where every time the stair hits and meets, every time we get these plateaus and landings, it then sets up a kind of different way of working. So all these breakout spaces that come naturally with moving from one floor to another. So Gertrude on the first floor can meet uh, Ingolf from the third floor somewhere on the second floor, and then they can have their meeting in this setting instead of maybe going to one or the other's office, right? So it allows for both a different kind of circulation, but also for a different kind of meeting and interaction with your colleagues uh, in the office. As a part of this is also these kind of built-in terraces that sit all the way around the building. So again, trying to kind of get up close to the building and really kind of uh, in a human scale into to, to the project itself. Uh, we recently also started uh, working a little bit in the arena uh, area. Uh, doing, we are doing two uh, arena projects now, both multi-form uh, arenas. Um, this here is the Royal Arena in Copenhagen. Uh, it was finished, I think, almost 10 years ago now. This is also, again, a kind of hybrid structure in the sense that it uses a coir wood uh, on all of its exterior cladding uh, to go through. It's a building that, uh, when it was built, as it looks right now, was sitting kind of in, in a new urban area outside, or a little bit outside of the center of Copenhagen. This is all going to be built in. And so essentially the mandate of the of the, the arena here was that it had to appeal and be part of the city fabric that comes up around it. So no more parking lots everywhere, no more uh, inaccessibility. Like if you go to Jersey to a soccer game, as I did uh, one of the other days, you have to traverse 25 minutes of raw asphalt before you get to, to something, right? I mean, and so I think this was really an attempt to see how can we humanize the arena as itself. Like it obviously requires a large footprint, but in this case, kind of lifting it up, creating retail areas all the way below. So there's lots of interaction and people can actually come and use the building on a, on a day to day basis, even when it's not. Uh, and here you can kind of see what I'm assuming is going to be a hockey game based on those weird helmets. 
Um, but this notion that you can kind of flow up and around and in and out of the building, so kind of an informal way of, of inviting you in. There is a main entrance, of course, but it's not something where, where you kind of prescribe to how to engage with the building itself. And here's the facade. This is basically untreated acquired wood uh, that uh, takes care of all of the shading for, for, for most of the building. It's a, it's a flexible arena, uh, meaning this is what it looks like in its kind of raw form. This is what it looks like when Metallica is playing there. Uh, so we can vouch for the uh, loudness of the, the system there. I just wanted to give you kind of a quick idea of how quickly you can actually change the program within an arena like that. So this is all in the time span of a little less than a week, um, back in the time when uh, uh, the, the national swimming, uh, the European Swimming League was being held in Copenhagen. You can kind of fairly quickly go from something that is one thing to another, right? And then uh, allowing the building to kind of really become different all the time and have, have, have different programmatic elements as we go through. Um, we're just now finishing up our second arena, which is uh, the Red Bull Arena in uh, Munich. It's right next to that Fry Auto uh, fantasticness. Uh, this is a competition we won, I would say, four years ago now, and now is, is in its kind of final stages. These are the competition entry images of it. So essentially here again, uh, an attempt to see there's an ice hockey arena and a basketball arena here. And I think one of the reasons we, 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 we won this project is that we essentially buried one of those two in the ground. So to, and by doing that, getting the volume and size of the building around it to be almost half of what is there and then extending the park area over it. So allowing for more park area while still maintaining the same kind of program. You can kind of see the two, the two arenas that are there. And this is what it looks like now. It's kind of being finished up. And the, the hill here in front is then where the, the hockey arena sits uh, down below. Uh, it is inherently, let's say, a glass building all the way through. And then it's clad with these kind of uh, elements that, that run up, that lifts up and come down and open up into the building, uh, but create these kind of pretty fantastic uh, uh, light views in through as you walk through. And I think this is another aspect of, of I think, this kind of sports and institutions where there's oftentimes an emphasis really on only what happens on the field or on the pitch inside something. This is a building that hopefully is designed in a way where you actually also want to be in those spaces around where all of the, the food and beverage uh, um, things are going to happen. This is what it looks like inside. Lots and lots of cranes, stuff, stuff putting up stuff on other stuff. And then there's this guy probably doing something very, very important, uh, I would imagine, uh, in that one world of things. I think one of the things that, that's uh, pretty nice about this, this particular building is that as it kind of lifts up on one side, it opens up and really creates an entry point into uh, to the arena itself. But as you move around it on the other side, it almost feels almost like a pavilion in the park. It gets down in a scale that's low enough that it becomes something that you can walk up to and, and interact with uh, as, you, as you go through. So I want to finish up here. I don't know why are we on time. Am I hitting that hour situation or is it... Is... That's the first time you've ever told me that. The, um, so I want to finish up here with two projects from uh, from our Sydney office in Australia. Uh, also two competitions we won, both uh, won almost at the same time, some eight plus years ago. Uh, the first one is the new uh, Sydney fish market, um, sitting at the bay, um, uh, just a little bit outside of, of let's say, downtown Sydney. Um, this was a competition we were invited to and essentially showed up and then said, we, 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 we don't know. Uh, we would love to work with you, but we, we we don't really have the answer to what a fish market is. We know that uh, that the fish market used to be this thing: a boat catches a fish, and then uh, they 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 sell that fish. But I think for us to be successful, we really have to hit a diagram much more like this. Like, what are all the other activities we can build up around it? I think some of you, probably none of you, maybe one of you, are old enough to remember the Fulton fish market and how you could. Uh, if you had a really good night, you could stack out somewhere around three or four in the morning from some bar very close by, and then you can go through that fish market where every fish in the world would be kind of out and get something to eat and then go home. Like that experience of seeing how fish are caught, like that, the, the process of going through is something that was kind of really inherently important here. Uh, but on the other hand, it also had to be a fully functioning fish market. This is going to be one, like the Sydney fish market is, is one of the biggest distributors of fish to, to that area or that, that region of the world at all. So, so working with the program and really understanding the program was kind of key to winning the competition and, and also uh, developing the building. And I think, you know, so on a kind of more, let's say, student-inspired note, 
I think one of the, the, the biggest challenges with architecture oftentimes is to be assumed that somebody comes to you, whether it's your teacher or, or your client, and says, you would like to have a kindergarten, and in that kindergarten there should be three bathrooms and, and, and two hallways and, and four other things. Um, it is then, I would say, in hand your job or our job to figure out, like, but what are all the other things that could also happen here? Like, what are the other things that we can add on to this or those programmatic elements that can key together to make more interesting buildings, right? I mean, I think... It is, I think, key to us in pretty much everything we do. When we receive a brief from a client, we read it through, we understand what are the bare minimum necessities of everything that has to happen. But then we also immediately go through and say, what are the 15 other things that could potentially also happen here? So it's a little bit back to this idea of kind of one plus one. Like you can't just do one thing, right? Because then you've kind of not hit the mark or you have made at, at best, let's say, a basic building. So... We took a little bit of inspiration from, from, let's say, the markets of old. This is in Marrakesh, the uh, Afghan Fna market, um, uh, a kind of UNESCO heritage market now. But like in the center of Marrakesh, the, this, this place exists. Uh, this is where the, the snake charmers are doing that thing with the cobra. You can get your palm red. You can get a, a kind of read on life. You can buy a little bit of, a, of spices or get told your future or just kind of buy a story in general. So during the day, it's a flexible market where everybody kind of comes and goes. And then at night, it becomes a kind of de facto eating spot for the whole city. So around kind of five, six o'clock, it changes radically in form, right? Everything is flexible enough that you come in, you can see. Um, you can get a full boiled uh, goat's head here. You can get the uh, snails, or you can get many, many other fantastic things. But the point uh, being that this this becomes the place that the city goes to 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 eat and drink. And it's something that changes quite radically from from, from day to night. This was one of our inspirations for how we wanted to approach the fish market because we know, we understand the, the aspect of the fish. They have to come in, they have to be sold, but we wanted to also kind of invite the public into it uh, and really emphasize the flexibility within. So, so as we go through and talk a little bit more about it, I will see that the, the upper levels of this consist of essentially a kind of food hall market or a restaurant-based uh, invitation. And each of those are divided into to smaller modules, very similar to what we work with on the Baltimore project in the ground floor, so things that can change within a week or within a month as you do the setup. So basically, if you come in January, you can see one constellation. If you come back six months later, it could be radically different or have changed to, to something else entirely. So here we're standing uh, on the, uh, the the fish side of things, so down on the lower levels, you can see the kind of um, the, the sales point on the side where the auction is happening. It's also a building that, that similar to Baltimore becomes a kind of continuation of the, the, the waterfront there. So, so essentially kind of swooping down and inviting you up. On the uh, right-hand side in the lower levels, it's a functioning fish market. And as you go up, the public marketplace and, and the office spaces sit on, on top and then all covered by this kind of loose roof that's there. But the roof essentially is just there to cover for sun. Like it is kind of a free market. So it's not a mall. It is exactly a, a kind of, let's say, replica of the, the Marrakesh situation where Booths sit underneath this, so it's for shade and protection more so than anything else. Mm -hmm. And here you can kind of see standing on the upper levels, looking out over the bay, and then and, and some of those uh, opportunities of kind of interaction there on the side with the restaurant levels, etc. Just kind of a quick. Uh, not realized it was not realized. Turned out. Turned out. <laughs> It's part of the kind of sales point for the city and then by understand how the project works. We kind of see sitting down by the bay, this was the area of um, the snippet of the office in Copenhagen. We have a visit. So the existing fish market is over here. This, this land is now going to be repurposed. Get all of it. Sitting on
actually grow faster. Covered with this kind of undulating flexible roof, and the roof is designed to lead water to specific points so we can gather all the water that comes down into each of the Big part of this is really to make sure that it doesn't become a block on the harbor, but so it actually walks through and interacts with the I don't know if I can actually speak much of it. It's also the music. I mean, now I have an excuse for all of this. So basically, the view is coming up and down. So this is kind of where we are. So we are starting to fill in or have filled in all of that plot of land as you saw in, in the model as well. Uh, the basement levels are coming up and essentially within the next, I would say, year or two, we should have a fully functioning building. This is a building that is estimated to be visited by around 5 million people a year, which is similar to the Tate Modern. So something that, that is kind of high on the list in, in, in Sydney to become a kind of landmark for them to, to, to focus on. Uh, we are starting to test out some of the uh, some of the structural system. This is also a hybrid system, so the entire roof is built of timber uh, as we go through, and we can kind of start seeing how some of those details go together in the mockups uh, to better understand like uh, is it is it what it needs to be? Does it have the right light coming in, uh, etc. Okay, there's hope. This is the last project, I promise. So uh, this is a competition we won also around eight years ago, almost simultaneously with the fish market. We were invited to do our first uh, high-rise competition. Um, our project uh, sits over here in downtown Sydney, this uh, fantastic thing there, uh, fairly close to this other Danish guy who built uh, you know, that thing, which I'm assuming you all know because you have studied architecture hard and long and, and read all of the books. Um, so it was really exciting for us to get invited to because basically... No Danish office had built anything in Australia or in Sydney since Utson left. Uh, and, and if you don't know why, then you should go back and read about how Utson left because there was a little bit of a, it didn't go super smoothly in the end, let's say. So one of the challenges we felt we, we had to kind of try and tackle here was to say, once we start building high, like how do we still maintain some of that, uh, the campus feeling that we have on the lower ground, right? I mean, so this idea of a stacking of a vertical village going up through, was something that we really wanted to carry through in the design from one end to the other. And, and, and really kind of trying to see if there's an opportunity in high-rise buildings to find a way to treat it more like a series of mid-rise buildings or smaller scale buildings that come together, but where you still have neighborhoods uh, within them. Our plot of land sits here in the, in the downtown, like the water is uh, right over here. And our site is kind of conveniently blocked by this other building uh, sitting right in front, which is landmarked and cannot be touched. So it's so already there, uh, let's say a little bit of a hurdle in, in in the design. This was the volume we were given, right? Obviously uh, not, let's say, ideal in terms of uh, views of the beautiful waterfront uh, next to it. And one of the really the first moves here was to try and see how do we find a way to, to manipulate this shape to, to focus the views around that existing building that sits in front of us. So the kind of twist of the building, so the lower levels that talk about the public domain kind of start looking out and the top levels get the harbor views uh, on the other side. Then breaking those down so we get some of these individual neighborhoods or blocks that we talked about, this kind of village idea where not every every floor in the building is the same, but really trying to put together uh, an idea of, of coexistence in here, but where you actually belong in a certain part of the building. Uh, and then utilizing those steps to create terraces up through. So, so every block or every volume in the building has its own kind of meeting spot and own terrace with views of, of, of the waterfront next to it. Um, so this was the competition entry we put in uh, a while back, uh, and this is what it looks like today. It was finished last year. 
So I think again, an example of how, like, if you really put the kind of time and effort in up front, you can actually kind of live up to to what the competition uh, becomes. Here we can kind of see it staggering. You can see the blocks coming down, uh, sitting next to the water, and those views that kind of try to kind of get get out and around the existing building, both up and up and down. You, maybe even more evident here, so you get sun and, and views from, from all sides. It also creates some pretty uh, staggering views as you look up, and you get this kind of almost spiraling uh, uh, pyramid situation, uh, which uh, I'm being told it will stay and will not fall down, so nobody has to worry about that. Uh, and somebody gets the either super cool or not very cool job of having to install all of those things that need to happen uh, dangling from, from various wires going through. So this is kind of the closest to the competition image we can get, like this kind of idea of, of this thing sitting next to and down by the, the waterfront in the city harbor. So I think the, the for us, of course, exciting to to uh, to get invited uh, into this kind of new realm of a high rises uh, and exciting to kind of try out. I think in some ways what, what is, is the most uh, uh, fascinating part about this project is that it's almost a kind of full, uh, full reuse of an existing tower that sat on that side, right? I mean, so I think if you if you if you go back and look at the building now, I think no one would really walk by it and think this is an old building that has been refurbished. Uh, but inherently, think about it as a new building. Uh, but it, it is essentially kind of a use of, of an existing high rise that was on the site, um, an old concrete building uh, sitting right behind that uh, that other AMP tower. So basically, the mandate here was to say. If you want to have all the square feet you can build, you need to find a way to work with this structure and reuse some of that structure. So again, somebody from up up high saying that if you want more money, uh, i.e., more square feet, you need to find a solution to that, and then we will give you an incentive to 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 get that done. So um, the idea here was to essentially remove all of the dark gray, kind of essentially scrape back the existing building, take off the crown and some of the side. You can kind of see in the plan up on top get back to the existing core, meaning that we can then start grafting onto the existing structure, maintaining 90% of the existing core and, and um, or 98% of the existing core walls and, and slabs that are there. And then adding onto that uh, almost double the square foot of new building, but we're using all of those same elements and adding one only one more lift, uh, double lift situation going up. So a building that kind of builds on top of an existing to try and create something new. Maybe. And here you can kind of see how that process works. It is, um, so essentially kind of scaffolding the existing, demoing the podium down below, and then kind of slowly starting to take off uh, the facade of the existing building. And also kind of partially demolitioning of, the, of that existing tower to get back into the core. And then starting already then to start testing out the facade and adding on the facade on the side. So that happens simultaneously with it and you start building up the lower levels of the new scaffolding or the new the new volumes that come through. And then kind of adding on on the top. So there you go. A couple of minutes is all it takes to kind of do a brand new high rise in uh, Sydney. Even it took, uh, I think, from the competition win to to finish around, I think it was all in kind of eight, seven, eight years. Uh, but in there, there were quite a bit of like political stops and starts, right? So the building itself was actually faster to build uh, once it got going. But there was a lot of kind of how do we position ourselves to 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 get to that? So. We'll talk a little bit more about like some of the savings and some of the reductions that, that come along with it. So this is what it looks like today, uh, sitting down by the waterfront. And again, I would say, you know, not something you would think of as an old building, uh, but probably more as something new that exists there. So back a little bit to this idea of the vertical village, right? I think uh, we wanted to try and find a way to get away from this idea of the, the simple stacked floor, meaning that every floor is the same. You don't really know where you are. This kind of uh, ambiguous idea that I go to work on, on the 15th floor and I go in and then I sit in my cubicle and I leave again. And we wanted to try and find a way to say or connect these volumes together so that you got essentially atrium experiences within all of them. So you, so each each volume on its own has its own atrium uh, that creates a kind of meeting point for everybody in the building. So as you look up at the volumes, those spaces sit in each of them. Some are taller, some are smaller, but all of them have them uh, and they can all be kind of adjusted over time. 
So this is what the atriums look like in, in some of the lower blocks as you go through. So essentially kind of full views out. Uh, and then uh, you may see the kind of familiar staircase from Foursquare in the back, right? I mean, so again, a kind of rerun of the idea that the circulation now is taken away from being just elevators, really emphasizing kind of getting up and connecting on floor through. Right behind this uh, stair is where the elevator comes out. So when you come out of the elevator, you can immediately see light on the outside. So you can actually orient yourself towards where you are going and, and where you want to meet people. And if you look at each of the, the volumes here, you can kind of see on, 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 um, on the left here, they can either be one full atrium. Uh, it can be filled in to have two or three atrium or four or, so, or, or whatever number you kind of desire over time. So uh, similar to what we kind of uh, tested out with T3, these atriums are designed to be able to be filled in and then build up over time, all by elements that can be uh, transported up to those floors using the existing elevators inside the building. So you need no crane, you don't need some extra access to do it, but simply kind of deciding, do you want more or less space within each of the volumes that go through? Which brings me back to my favorite slide. You can either build the crazy dragon, the weird spider, or that Terminator robot again. But like this idea that we can take those elements that are in buildings and really kind of use them to kind of do new things over time so one building doesn't become static uh, and, and kind of incorporate a level of future proofing as we go through. You can kind of see some of the taller atriums uh, going down through. And then each of those blocks get these pretty terrific terraces with views over the, the view at Harbor. So essentially every block has its own meeting point and its own place to kind of uh, come outside. It also means that each block has access to uh, exterior, you know, both daylight, but also fresh air, etc. You can kind of see looking down the building as you go all the way down to the podium, you get those terraces that step down through. I think just because we're Danish, there's an inherently uh, vast number of images with our building and the opera house in the same shot. So I apologize for the uh, <laughs> the uh, incredible branding aspect of uh, our presentations. Even the other aspect of what we wanted to focus on here was how do you how do you use a single building to also invigorate the neighborhood? Like this was the road that comes up straight along our building, uh, essentially a kind of multi-lane bus road that was then moved away. Uh, the city uh, put the buses in some some other place as we go through. Uh, this was the competition entry for that. And this is what it looks like today. So essentially you kind of find a way to create kind of multi-level retail and access points through. It's a building that sits on a fairly sloped site. So you get kind of several levels in one corner and all the way down to, to ground level on the other. Um, this is the main entry to the tower itself. So this is ex essentially the existing building reclad with that facade we put on everything else that kind of sets up your entry point to the office building proper. And then along the podium, there are these kind of niches and cutbacks that that, uh, that sets up views of, of existing historic buildings around. So kind of a way to break down a little bit of the scale of the podium. So not just one wall, but things that come from all the way through. This is the lower terrace kind of looking up at, at the building itself. And here you can kind of see what, what some of those level changes gave us, like really kind of an opportunity to meander through the building and, and create multi-level spaces as we go through. So there's a lot of kind of activity, in those same ideas of atrium spaces, restaurants, et cetera, that happen through the building. So it's not just an office building uh, for, for the people that work there, but also for everybody who kind of passes by uh, that can use it. Um, another aspect that we wanted to try out with this was to, to, to kind of uh, find a way to look a little bit of this kind of the idea of the fully glazed high rise. Like there's a kind of a notion, uh, I'm not sure if it's a North American notion, but it seems to happen a lot here that if you are building high rise buildings, they have to essentially be glass all the way through. And we very deliberately wanted to find a way to work with the pattern in this building, just uh, not only because we wanted to find ways to reduce solar and, and, and heat, but also because we wanted the, the individual volumes to kind of stand up. And so the building is clad in this, and then every time it, it lifts up, it, it has a kind of clear glazing behind. Um, but the pattern is kind of uh, deliberately kind of staggered out so you don't get lines that run all the way up, meaning that when you start looking at the building, um, you get both this notion of performance, meaning that we reduce the, uh, the solar radiance by, by almost uh, like 30 plus percent, meaning that this essentially is a building that needs no shades at all. Uh, you could operate this without having blinds and shades in the building and still meet the, the criteria that's there. But also the staggered pattern means that you really read the volumes as you go up as individual blocks uh, through. So the idea was not to create uh, the world's tallest building, let's say, and, and give it this kind of lifted facade. The word was really to try and emphasize these different elements as we go through. And as you can move around the building, the, the, the frames that go onto the building have different depths and dimensions that, that correspond to the sun and the, 
um, for the level of sun that it hits there. So on some, some sides it's deeper, on some shallow, but essentially kind of evening out to get to that 30% that we wanted to try and hit. The whole facade itself is angled just slightly outward, meaning that it also takes off some of the glare that comes in. And again, back to the thing that if you have these views, you really want to try and find a way to not have some kind of weird solar shading coming down uh, in front all the time, right? So maybe there will be shades and it's built so that they can be put in at the end of the day, but it can function and operate uh, without. Please notice once again, we managed to get the opera house in uh, uh, <laughs> to our shot. And here's how it sits uh, next to the opera house down by the, by the water. So, I mean, kind of in conclusion here, right? We wanted to, with, with, this, with this particular high rise, given the fact that there was a mandate of trying to reuse the things, also try and test out, like, how can we really hit this on a number of different ways? So on the social level, like, how can we create spaces inside uh, something this tall that really connects people together? On an urban level, how can we make something that invites you to actually come and participate in it? And of course, on, on the environmental side, you know, really focusing on how can we reuse all of that existing uh, buildings at them? So if you look at the, the quick quarter tower here, it's kind of, you know, half half transformed, half retained, right? So half of the building is there already, which which saves us, uh, let's say, an immense amount of, of CO two simply by reusing what was already there. Also thinking about all of that, you know, just the reuse itself is, is fantastic, but also thinking about all of that stuff that would essentially become landfill somewhere else, right? So there's a kind of dual factor to 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 that aspect of it. For some reason, it always has to come down to some comparison with flight. So apparently, you can fly fourteen thousand times to uh, London, based on the same. Um, from a client side, it becomes really exciting because they saved one hundred and fifty million uh, Australian dollars by by reusing the, the existing building that's there. Meaning that you know there's real value and real money to be made uh, in this if it falls through. Uh, and it was also finished one year earlier than expected, meaning that revenue can start getting generated from a building like this much sooner again. So I kind of win-win for from the client side, right? It's something that uh, I have learned now over several years of standing in many, many boardrooms with many, many old white men and looking them in the eye and saying they would love to do something sustainable, but they would also just like to know how much money they can make on it. So this is kind of a test case for that and I think a way to kind of talk about it. And I think for me or for us, uh, the whole idea here, the whole kind of... Uh, Hopefully, the gist of the talk today is to start thinking about what it is we want to do. Like we have, until somebody comes up with something super smart in terms of space travel, this is our planet. And there's a limited amount of resources in this planet to use. We can keep digging, we can keep using whatever is there, but there's not going to be more of it. And I think we are at a point now where we really need to seriously understand and kind of think about architecture much more so as how do we reuse what we have versus building something new, which would give us, I think, at least a fair shot of all kind of existing here in a couple of thousand years as we go along. Thank you. It would have been a... Thank you. Questions? No. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to. Are there any questions? Wait, are you leaving already? Hello, hello. How you doing? Can you hear me? Yeah. How you doing? My name is Ethan, um, fourth year architecture student. Um, my question was about the fish market and the mass timber roof. Was there any thought about like how the water vapor would affect that structure itself or? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I can use this one. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, no, and, and that's why the mock-ups are built, right, to kind of try and test and see, but, but essentially because of the volume of sizes of it, it doesn't have any notable effect. I think also we should kind of remember that, uh, and, and, and this, is, this is a kind of constant uh, source of amusement to me, but we keep thinking about timber as this kind of new and fantastic thing. There's been, I would say, 10 to 15,000 years now of, of timber construction uh, all around the planet, right? A lot of it happened on the harbors for those big warehouses that were there. And one of the things that happens to wood, right, is it actually gets denser and denser over time, right? I mean, so, so there are... There are multiple good things to say about timber, right? I mean, it's it's very good for 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 fire insulation, and, and it's very good for for this kind of retention of water, etc. Like it, once it's kind of set, it's like it settles and becomes what it is, right? So, it 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 works. Let's say. Yeah. Wow. Oh, 
Can I just talk? Can you hear me? Yeah. So another question was uh, the T3 bay side. Since you have those kind of um, the the double height atriums connecting to each other, how do you deal with you know sound and also since it's fully glazed, how do you deal with the kind of sun penetrating into those double height connected atriums? Yep. So so the the bay side projects has like thirty millimeter deep lamellas running all the way on the outside, uh, centimeters. Sorry. Uh, meaning that that takes around 20% of the sun that comes in already. That building will require shades, and those shades are built in as well. I think for the, for the atrium spaces that are interconnected, two things are proving problematic or challenging, let's say. Uh, so by Canadian code, we allow to connect only two atrium spaces at a time, meaning that you can have two spaces open to each other. Then we need a glass wall and a fire rating going through. Right? So there are ways around that. You can have different ways of fire rating. You can, could have... Uh, you can open it up the entire way, but that means a different kind of sprinkler layer going through, right? So it's a little bit of this thing where you start the process, you start learning what are the what are what are the restrictions that you're up against and what are the challenges you come out of it. So I think likely it will be individual spaces either on their own enclosed or put together one or two or three at a time. A lot of it will depending on whether it's a single tenant or multi-tenant that takes the building, right? Because then you can start thinking about how much you want to connect or not, right? Um Inside all of these spaces, there's there's uh, acoustic panels built in to take part of it. And then the idea is that furnishing, et cetera, will take other aspects of it, right? But it is a kind of spec, it's a spec warehouse building in that sense, right? So the, the notion in some ways here is not to be perfect on a sound side or perfect on the material side, et cetera. It's really to kind of test out and see what can we do and how can we experience those things uh, uh, together. Sorry, just... Look at that. It's like a forest of hands. Mm -hmm. Um, I was going to ask about your like, so there's a lot of like modular work that you guys do. So a lot of it is about like the client having an option. Um, as far as those buildings go, has a client changed anything about it since you guys left it or designed it? Like, has there been an incident of that or? It hasn't been there for long enough. So it's a good question. And I think one I can't answer. I think in two to three years, I can have that conversation, right? Because they're just going up now, right? I mean, so QQT, the last party we looked at was finished last year. It's built now with full atriums in, in, in all of them, right? So what we will do now is to say what happens in a year, what happens in two years. Is this actually, is this a terrible idea we thought would be really fantastic? Or is it actually something that, that will work, right? In, in the Bayside projects, um, we are literally testing out on the first building, double height and single height spaces to see how does it work, what's the better thing, what does clients want when they come in, right? And so, so there's an opportunity to kind of see what that process does, right? And I think this is, it's it's a good question, I think, in the sense that we, I think, as architects, we, we tend to kind of do a kind of hit and run uh, scenario about things, right? We build it, and then uh, nobody really ever wants to come back again unless it wins a prize, right? I mean, as a, I think we have a very different attitude towards our buildings, is that we want to try and get in afterwards and see and understand not just what, what worked well, but also what definitely did not work, right? I mean, and sometimes things don't work, right? We have projects where they were designed to have flexible office spaces everywhere, and then it turns out nobody wants to work in that, and then we have to come in again and do something else, or vice versa, right? I mean, so, but I think the important part there is to say that there is that flexibility built in into the projects we do, right? And I think we try to find in, in all of our projects, I would say a kind of very pragmatic approach to structure, meaning that we, 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 we think and believe that we can get exciting projects out uh, that have you know both, let's say, sculptural value or exciting beauty or whatever it is, without necessarily having to kind of uh, think about structural ways of doing it that become increasingly difficult to deal with over time, right? So it's another way for our clients to say, we have beautiful buildings. They're also structurally sound in the sense that they're built around grids or easy to erect, right? So we are not asking them to put $50 million into giant cantilevers, but we are asking them to follow these directions of, of, of how to get it done. Um, how are you thinking about accessibility through, because I've seen in several of your um, projects, you centralize the circulation with you know, in the modular ones, the circulation, the stairs go all the way up, and there are several instances of the building um, being lifted so it could attract more people. 
So how are those with disabilities incorporated in those circulation? So, so all of the buildings, of course, have elevated access to all of the, the, the levels that are there, right? I mean, and I think it's, it's a good question in the sense that, that one of the things we, we've started thinking more about now, and, and, and I would say maybe less so uh, five to 10 years ago, is that it's, it's not just about getting there. Like, uh, can you get to the same point in the building? It's also what is the experience of you getting there, right? I mean, and so I think... And I'm not sure we are, I'm, I have to be honest and say, I don't think we've found the right, the right answer to this yet, right? I think for now we can say all of the spaces are of course accessible, but it would really also be great if you could find a way to have that experience of getting to those spaces to be equally exciting and interesting for, for people who have maybe limited uh, opportunity to do this. Right? We were working on a project uh, on the West Coast for a while, also a timber building, which is a project that stopped now for one of the last tech guys, and there, this was really one of the, the, the questions at the forefront of what they wanted to try and explore, to make sure that every time we have an exciting space, it should be equally exciting to, to arrive in a wheelchair or legs, or if you can't walk at all, or whatever it is, right? Because the experience of getting to the space and then that movement through it should be equally important to, to, to the, let's say, the, the visual or the outcome of it. So I think there's work to do there, and I don't have the right answer in some ways, right? And, but but it, is, it is a balance, I would say, between the two. No, Thanks. No, no, no. Yes, no. yes. Um, first, congratulations. Really an amazing accomplishment to get to where you are. So I know nobody else worked on any of these projects. Yeah. So I, I know what it took. So I am uh, I'm just you. congratulations, Appreciate first and foremost. Um, but uh, I'm really curious about process. So you win the competition, you get a contract. Does the contract take you from schematics through CA? Like, where do you guys, are, are you, will you pass it off to the local architect to get it built? It doesn't look that way. It looks like there's CA going. It looks like you're in the field making sure things get built. Yeah. But the, the model of practice that you're kind of building on is one where there's an associate architect to get stuff through the building department and coordinated with the MEPs. And then we kind of, like you say, hit and run. Is there, but there's also, I can hear a real kind of, uh, ethos here of we don't just do renderings we we do buildings which yeah. requires a lot more can you talk about that no absolutely and, and i think the the answer is that actually it, it changes a lot depending on where in the world we are right so in europe we do or can do the full scope of of, of everything there meaning that we can take take on from concept to uh also i would say you forgot we win the competition then there's drinking right and then you start the uh the negotiations of it. <laughs> uh, so so uh, we, 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 we oftentimes in, in on the European market, through that full process going through, there is, I mean, as as you know, right, there's a thousand versions of how something goes from from A to B in that sense, right? Oftentimes, you find that clients have a preferred contract that they want to make. A preferred contract that they want to. Can I borrow that? Like they have a preferred team they want to work with, then that has to be incorporated into it, right? Is there a local architect on AOR? So. It depends a lot on where that falls, right? Outside of Europe, we work only as design architects. And, and this is, uh, I would say, both a curse and a blessing in some ways, right? I mean, it, it means that we, at the 3XN side, do the majority of our work up front through the concept SD and DD phases. And then we have a limited oversight role going through, but we have an oversight role, meaning that in all of our contracts, it states that the local architect on the team um, needs to get approval from us every time a drawing comes in or goes through or something changes, right? Uh, that process, as, as as Matthias can speak to as well, right, can be either stellar or fantastic, depending on the team you have on the ground. We have had some some really great experiences uh, working with people in, in, in Toronto, but we have also experienced, uh, let's say, let's say less motivated teams, right? I mean, and I think that's where it becomes really problematic, and this is where... I think your relationship with the client is, is kind of key, right? There needs to be a level of trust in there. And I think that the second layer from us is to say that we, and this is uh, what, what gives me uh, gray hair and uh, nightmares is that we, uh, we, we can't stop, right? I mean, there, there's never going to be a moment where, where somebody says, you know what, if you don't uh, do something else, then it's going to be that thing, right? I mean, then we will do that thing, even if we don't get paid for it, right? I mean, so there's a level of, of, of following through on all of those levels, right? But, it's not it's not easy, and I think it's 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 frankly something that um, 
I would say on a near daily basis, we learn new things about, right? I mean, and I think it's 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 a real challenge to to get those teams together who have kind of equal ambition from from one end to the other. Right? I think for us, when we when we start a process like this, we we if we are lucky, we get to be part of of, of picking the uh, the local teams, the AORs that are on the ground in in those areas we work with, and then we make a real effort to actually include them in the design upfront. So so. Everybody gets ownership of what happens. We are we are doing the work, but we want to make sure they see it, understand it. They tell us what works, what doesn't work. This thing is stupid. That thing could be great. That doesn't work for local code, whatever it is. And then we modify, right? I mean, so that by the time we get out of the concept and SD phases, it, it, if we've done our job well on our side, it should feel like it's everybody's project, right? And I think in those projects where, where that happens, they will inevitably become uh, successful because everybody wants to do them at the end, right? When we have projects where halfway through the client decides they want to switch the uh, local team out and get a new team in uh, because they wanted to save uh, fifty percent on the fee of, of something, then the nightmare starts, right? Because then there's no there's no shared kind of a starting point, and and without that, it really just becomes oversight, and and oversight kind of sucks in, in in every possible way, right? Because you would say that's not really what we were thinking, and somebody else will say, well, I don't really care because I'm going to build it, and then we'll say, well. The, that's not cool, man, because we talked about uh, and uh, and so on and so forth, right? I mean, and then those processes are, are almost impossible to control, I think, right? I mean, and so I would say, for better or worse, now a vast majority of my job is not deciding beautiful things anymore, but having long conversations with people about how's your family doing? Because if your family is doing okay, maybe we can talk about how how we could do this thing a little bit better, right? Because we could also just and try, and maybe it's this way. So, there's a lot of that, right? I mean, as a, um, but I think what we can say is that in this market here, we are only successful if the local team is good and successful as well, right? I mean, and I think one of the things we are very kind of uh, kind of forefront of our minds is that anyone who works on the project gets to take uh, take the, the the shared honor of whatever comes out of it at the end, right? I mean, so there's never going to be a version of this where it's a three XN project and then nobody else is involved in it, right? Like we really want to emphasize the group aspect of, of all of those things that come through. Mm -hmm. Hello. <laughs> I second, it was amazing work. Um, thanks for presenting it. Um, I specifically wasn't interested in everything, but the, uh, the final project with the skyscraper um, that had so honestly, like you know, that that's the hip thing now. Everything's got to be cantilevered. You got the, the the twisty building, and usually when I see them, I'm thinking, oh my god, thermal bridging everywhere. Um, that it's not driven by anything that's that's um, thoughtful. And what you're basically were presented was that that was molded by the sun um, for a daylighting strategy. And so I'm wondering if you could just describe. I don't know how much how involved you were in that part of it, but like the the iterative process by which that's developed. Yeah, no, I, I don't disagree that everything has to be staggered and twisty. Uh, I, I will in, in, in our defense say that we started eight years ago when we were like at the forefront of cool staggering and, and twisty things as a as a thing. So I think in, in part, like weirdly, um, we can go back to this for a second. Uh, like that top volume here of the building, see if I can find a good view of it. So the top volume here uh, and that shape and that cut it has uh, defines the exact amount of shade we are allowed to cast over a botanical garden that sits on the other side. So that volume was almost given uh, on its own as this is the maximum amount we can build there. And right? down below, we had restrictions of how much we could build there uh, as well. And we really want to try and get that twist in so some of that facade didn't look into it. So a big part of it was driven by what can we do on the top and what can we do below and then kind of get a, a kind of balance running down through that, right? So the sun itself is more taken care of by uh, by the performance pattern on the facade than, than it is by the volumes themselves. They do shade from themselves as well as they go through, right? But, but it was kind of a game of how do we maximize square feet up top where we want as much as possible while keeping to the restrictions of that. I think it's like literally right here, that botanical garden that has restrictions on how much shade we are allowed to cast. And then as we go through, right? And so it was also trying to maximize the amount of square foot that the client would get based on reusing what was existing on the site, right? So there's a bonus added into that. So I would say, I don't think the building itself 
doesn't necessarily do everything it needs to do in order to shade from the sun or move from the sun. The pattern on the building takes care of most of that. And then the rest is, is, is essentially a series of restrictions as you move up. Can I have one follow up to that? And so, because what I'm saying is that it's, it's beautiful and it's as, it's as successful as a form as anything else that, in this genre, but um, you had to be dedicated to that idea from the beginning. And so you had to, to, to some degree, let the, let the sun or that concept drive the form, but you're still able to come up with something that architects would take seriously and love. So I'm wondering if there's, you know, is that just something you guys do or does that take some kind of adjustment to your design process or... I mean, there's a lot of testing of volumes, right? I mean, this, I mean, uh, you know, this is model number 498, right? right? I mean, and so, 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 uh, yes, we take it seriously, but I think there is also, I mean, this is in, in all projects we do, there's a balance between what is it we want to do, like how do we want it to perform, but also do we like it, right? I mean, like we can't, uh, and, and I think we, we, we can try and talk our way out of it in every possible angle of that, but at the end of the day, if you're sitting there looking at something that looks like a kind of uh, like a dead dog, then you're also thinking, will I spend the next five to eight years building uh, this thing and then and going through? So, I mean, I think what, what's exciting for me about this is that it kind of ticks all the boxes. And I'm sure like if we, if we, if we had kind of optimized more in different ways, the volume would probably have changed slightly differently as, as going through, right? But in some ways, it's also like, where do you stop in, 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 in that, that sequence, right? I mean, and where does it get to a point where the client is happy, you can get your square feet. We can find the value in the architect that is there, right? So there's a balance there. It's it's something that we be like that that balance between trying to do the right thing and then making architect is something we see a lot in London now, where the city has kind of prescribed that you can almost not get a building permit unless you can somehow prove that the building that is existing on site has to be torn down because it's terrible, or you have to reuse it or something. Right? And what we find oftentimes is that that. In, in reality, the best thing you could do was simply to take pretty much any existing volume, right, and then apply much better glazing, much better, you know, uh, materials to it, like insulate it to the end of the world, right, optimize all the systems, and then you actually get likely the best outcome of a building and, and performance at the same time. However, that doesn't really satisfy, let's say, half of the clients who also want something they can sell, something they can lease, something they can... Uh, Happen. So, so we find ourselves in this kind of weird conundrum. I was, I was going to show one of those projects today, but kind of cut it out where, where we, we have looked at metrics for, you know, for one particular case in Mark Lane in London, where we take a building that the client comes to us and says, you know, it, it's right in dead center of London. It's a six-story, seven-story office building. It looks horrendous. I mean, just by all uh, standards, right? I mean, and, and I say this as somebody who really never uses words about ugly or not ugly about something, this thing just kind of sucks. And, and it, but it's in a place in a city where they have to command a certain level of rent to, to maintain the building there. Right? And so looking at the, the material library or going through the building and understanding what structure is there and how we could do it, easily we could say the best kind of carbon solution here would be to simply be it and somehow get it slightly better. Right? But that wouldn't really satisfy the client's need for having a building they could sell. So therefore we have to go, what is the second level? What is the third level? And, and kind of seeing those metrics of saying, we have to accept a building that is maybe uh, it, it's less carbon driven than we wanted it to be, but it has to, from an architectural side, perform from a visual standpoint, from an interest standpoint as well. And then, and I think it's it's easy to forget that there's this kind of at the end of the day we work for people, right? I mean, and 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 we somehow have to fulfill an, an array of, of 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 terrible things that come in and out, right? It can be, you know, now I want a blue ball, or it should be a yellow canary, or whatever it is, right? I mean, as a and I think our job somehow is to find that middle point between like how can we push that client long enough and far enough, but also understand that like this, at the end of the day, if they don't want to pay for it, nothing will happen, right? I mean, and, and, and if you can't get it built, then, you know, what is there already is definitely going to be worse, right? I mean, so, so balance points is, uh, I feel, I'm not sure I answered your question, but I feel like I talked for 10 minutes, so that must count for, for a couple of I mean, I'm not a host here, but I, I think that's like an amazing way to sort of end this presentation, just talking about how in reality, you know, what starts out as this grand idea can sometimes get moved along by reality. And I guess... That's right.
Did you? I mean, yeah, I, know. I know it's the difference. Did you try to run just a we yeah. made it? Was it? <laughs> That's why it took me a while. That might be good. Yeah. Yeah. I ran the simulation before. That puts it. Okay. If it did, I did see it said something weird about it. Because I, I, 